Right, you're very welcome. Eamon Ryan is my name. I feel like the parish priest here. I'm about to give announcements out at the start before we do anything. Next week, the IAA will hold an event Tuesday, the 24th of September. The director of the Global McKinsey Institute will uh, give a talk on the technological social responsibility in the AI area. So I presume everyone here might, 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 might be interested in that. Um, very glad to introduce Jonathan Ryan. Uh, on the lecture or the talk he's going to give on the economics of artificial intelligence, the knowns, unknowns, and unknown unknowns. Uh, he's a lecturer in MIT and adjunct lecturer at Trinity, a member of the Global Economics and Management Group at the Sloan School of Management and MIT. And more than anything else, I'm proud to say he's a graduate of University College Dublin. <laughs> John, the floor is yours. Thank you very and much. We will open. The opening session is, is on the record, it's recorded, and then we go to uh, anything afterwards is, is, is the content can be taken away, but not attributed to, to any one speaker. John. Thank you very much. So first of all, uh, Deputy Ryan, uh, Deirdre, and all the members of the IIEA, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here today. Um, uh, it's, uh, I, I visited here, I suppose, it's probably maybe about a year ago, and we talked about some of the ideas, and it's great to be back and actually talking to a, a wider group this time. Um, so... Um, just before we get started, how are we doing for time? So I make sure I'm, I'm close. Are we starting on time? I have a thing with the bell after about 20, 25 minutes. Perfect. You can your time. Okay. Um, so it's not often I get to quote Donald Rumsfeld, so I knew I was talking to some uh, policy people today, and so uh, I think Henry Kissinger called uh, Donald Rumsfeld, Trump, uh, called, um, I think he said, he, uh, Kissinger said he was, the most, uh, was it the most evil person I've ever met? So um, I thought that was a good setting for talking about artificial intelligence and how it's all going to affect our lives. Um, so, there we go. Um, yeah, the reason though I'm talking about knowns, unknowns, and unknown unknowns, it's, um, it's really that so much to do with artificial intelligence today, there's a lot of hype around it. And one of the things I'm gonna try and do is split out a little bit between the hype and the reality. That's kind of going to be the focus of it. Um, so when Rumsfeld was given his knowns and unknowns and all that, he was asked a very direct question. And what he was using it is to be obtuse. And I'm going to try and use it to actually as a framework to explain what we do know, what we don't know, and what we potentially have no idea about in, in, in simple terms. There we go. Um, so before I get started, different people might have different interpretations of AI or whatever, but I think we'll just cut to the chase in terms of AI has a long history, but really we're going to focus on a branch of it called machine learning, and that's where all the developments have been. We wouldn't be sitting around, sitting around talking about this today unless it was for machine learning, a particular branch of artificial intelligence. There are other elements to it, but this is the, I wouldn't call it just the sexy one at the moment. This is the one that's had a lot of the development. Um, but it's important before we talk about anything to do with policy or anything to do with implementation of it that we really kind of understand the technology. And that's one of the real difficulties with the hype that's surrounding the topic at the moment. Um, and th this idea that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Of course, we'll all understand it in a couple of years' time. Um, but today it all looks like magic and it's difficult to differentiate. So here's an example I like to talk about from um, you know, anybody who's involved in computer science or development of uh, products, applications will get this one. So uh, you've got the guy on the left saying to the programmer, when a user takes a photo, the app, we're de developing an app here, should check whether they're in a national park. And the developer said, sure, that's a GIS uh, lookup. I uh, should take a couple of hours. And then the, the guy on the left said, that's great, I'm going to have this app. Also, can you check whether the photo is of a bird or not? And then the researcher says, well, I need a research team, five years, and several million of a budget. So it seems like, you know, if you don't know the differences to what you're asking for when you're developing something like this, that they don't seem like they're radically different requests, but except one is very simple and the other is very tough. The reason I showed this one is that this is a traditional computer science um, uh, uh, little joke, I suppose it's barely a joke, but um, let's call it a joke. And I think the interesting thing about this is with machine learning today, they've actually solved checking whether it's a photo of a bird or not. And today the, the programmer would say, yeah, that's no problem, give me five minutes for that as well. Okay, so artificial intelligence, I really think an awful lot of the hype has got to do with the name that's on it. When the original uh, a dozen or so men got together in Dartmouth College in 1956 and they had a little conference and they came up with the name artificial intelligence, um, we sh 
we should remember where they came up with the name. And it's got to do with, frankly, they were looking to get uh, a $13,000 grant for, a, for, for holding the conference. Um, there had been a conference on the same topic with the same rough bunch of men a couple of months before that, and it was on cybernetics, which is what the field was known as back then. Um, but that was such a dud of a conference, they couldn't get funding for it, so they came up with a new name for the next conference. And when they went to the Rockefeller Foundation and asked for $13,000, they came back and said, we'll give you half of it, because honestly, we have no idea what you're talking about. So when they come up with the name AI, it's not to be taken literally. I think a lot of the confusion comes to do with, well, I know what my intelligence is as a human being, and it's just a computer copying the same thing. It is definitely not that. And we, we, we have no, there's nobody, no serious scientists I know in the world actually working on that problem. Um, but that does not mean that AI or, or, or machine learning can't do a lot of uh, very interesting things in the short term. Um, just to give you a 30 second insight as to what actually happens, if anybody know Gary Kasparov, he was beaten uh, in what was called a breakthrough moment for artificial intelligence as it was called back then. Um, uh, when he was he was the world champion, the greatest ever chess player at the time, and he was uh, beaten by IBM. Uh, Big Blue, I think, was Deep Blue was the name of the the computer application. In fact, they weren't using what we would call uh, AI today. They were just using lots of processing power at the time. So um, there was nothing really that advanced in it. It only was it, it was a development in computation power, not development in anything intelligent as we would describe it today. Um, and so uh, the problem with beating someone like Gary Kasparov in chess, although it's very hard, it was a computation problem. How many, how many, uh, like if you know what a decision tree is, it's just basically a very advanced, very quick decision tree with a big computer that can go down about 10 steps. Um, and Gary could only go down about nine. And so the problem with so many things that computers can't do is that they need rules for it. And there's so much to do with our day-to-day -day life that we know so much more than we can tell. We can't describe how it is exactly that we know what a kitten is. My 18-month-old niece knows that this is a kitten, and she can't really speak at the moment. So, uh, but yet she knows. So how do human beings do this? If we can't describe something in a set of rules, if this, then that, then we can't traditionally tell a computer how to recognize something. And so this has been the hard limiting factor in so much of computer science for, for 50 years. And what machine learning does, it really comes along and what, in, in dramatically simplified butchered terms, is by giving, some, by giving these learning algorithms lots of data, if you show 10,000 pictures of a cat and 10,000 pictures of a dog, and in each picture you label where the cat is and where the dog is, at the end of the 10,000 you showed a, showed a new picture and it will tell you whether it's a cat or a dog. And it's done this by really, it's like walking into a kitchen and you give a robot um, a, a, all the shelves and you give it an oven and you say whatever's in that shelf, uh, keep mixing it up with any random combination you want, keep putting it in the oven, bake it for half an hour and see what comes out. Well, when I tell you that story, you could tell it's going to take a long time for by random chance and by adjusting of parameters that the, that the robot is going to figure out how to make a perfect cake. It's going to take a long time because it doesn't know it's putting tomato ketchup in with brown sauce and it's expecting a cake. Okay, so that's not going to work very well. The problem with that is, as we can imagine, that it takes the robot half an hour to do each iteration. The thing with a large scale processing like this is that you can do a trillion of these, or sorry, maybe not a trillion, you can do several hundred uh, million of these iterations in an hour. And so with the advent of, comp uh, of high process computation, with these new algorithms, we're able to try out lots of recipes very quick and you find the one that works. And so it's not that it actually knows in any sense how to make a cake or how cakes are made or what ingredients are, but it just tried lots of combinations, kept adjusting the parameters of the recipe and it comes out knowing how to make a cake. That's really what a lot of machine learning is today. Um, so what it does in, uh, in economics terms, the economics of AI is the name of the uh, thing and uh, in an economist's parlance really all we'd care about is cost because everything is, uh, nothing is as interesting to us as cost. So um, 
what is, uh, you know, what did, Google dropped the cost of searching something to zero. I used to have to go into the library in Trinity and actually spend time or maybe even spend money in searching for something. Now it's instant. So cost went to, of search went to zero. Uh, the cost of telecommunications when I use WhatsApp has gone to zero. I used to have to physically send a fax or post something. It took time and money and now it's zero. So what does AI change in terms of changing a fundamental in the economy? It changes the cost of prediction. And so... Um, this here is puppies or muffins, and what we can do is uh, you can check how good human beings are identifying. Is it a puppy or is it a muffin? And then we can train a machine learning algorithm, and hey presto, we can get machine learning algorithms that can do it better than humans today. So that's a prediction exercise. Um, now, you can then take that and give it to lots of, uh, train that on lots of applications. It's not like a human being. We can both identify um, puppy or muffin, but we can also do lip reading. Some people can do lip reading. Um, and so we can train a different algorithm to start uh, doing lip reading because it's a prediction exercise. And as long as we can train it sufficiently, um, we're getting quite good at it. So is this uh, uh, Bill Murray doing a Tom Hanks impression, or is it Tom Hanks? Anybody got, a, anybody got a thought on it? Don't feel too bad. The computer is better than you as a group. Yeah, Tom Hanks? Tom Hanks. Fine. Yeah, it is actually Bill Murray doing a Tom Hanks impression. Um, but we've trained uh, a algorithm, or Google actually, trained an algorithm to, to identify stuff like that. Um, I uh, uh, have spoken recently with a, um, uh, a leading hedge fund uh, um, manager uh, who uses lots of advanced algorithms and computation. Uh, but the insight, in, insight here around prediction and judgment is very important, splitting those two things up. Human beings are constantly navigating the world using both prediction and judgment. I predict what it is that's going to happen, and then I'll use my judgment to decide how it is I'm going to react. Computers and artificial intelligence still is only focused on prediction. We've got no real judgment in there. So, for example, um, this hedge fund manager knew, statistically knew, you know what I mean? It's not no certain, but a high degree of confidence that Donald Trump was going to win the election. Now, you would think that's an incredible insight for somebody who manages $100 billion of, uh, of money, and you would think, well, you know, they're going to make a ton of money off this. Well, actually, no, because even though you have good prediction on what's going to happen, you still have to judge what it is that, that you're going to do with that money. So, so what? Trump is going to win. Does that mean the market's going to go up or going to go down? Where does that mean you're going to invest in equities or going to invest in bonds? You still need to lose. Uh, uh, it's an outlier event. You still need to use human judgment. He didn't actually make any money off the trade. Uh, he pulled out of it because he was just too too difficult to, uh, to make the judgment cost. But the prediction was there from the day that they were go, uh, doing. And so then when we're talking about AI and a lot of the predictions about what's going to happen, it's really hard to make predictions, especially about the future. And so that's one of the things that I'm cautious about doing. An example would be when Microsoft Excel came along, and it, or let's say Microsoft Word. It's a bit like um, is it, uh, Mad Men, you know, that TV show uh, where it's a secretary pool. Typically, it used to be all women back in the 60s, or at least in the show. Um, they sit outside and they type up the letters for the CEO. And if you were to say, uh, bring a group of them together, the typing pool, and say, well, actually, this new thing Bill Gates is inventing in his garage is going to be a personal computer and he's going to have Microsoft Word in it. And you would have thought to everybody there, they were like, great, that's going to make our jobs a lot easier because we don't have to, every time we mess up, we don't have to go in and, and use a bit of Tipex to clean up the letter. And you're actually saying, no, everybody here is going to lose their job and the CEO is actually going to do the letters himself. You'd be like, well, that sounds absolutely ludicrous. I mean, who's going to bet that that's going to happen? And so it's very difficult. That's even a first-order effect on the implementation of a radically new technology into something that we already know. So that's first order. The, uh, the complexity of trying to predict what's going to happen with the full economy just and with jobs and everything to do with that, it's, it, it, it's, it's far too complex. And it's not that we just didn't get enough smart people in the room or throw enough computing power with it. It's... Uh, an actual unknown, okay, um, to talk about in Rumsfeld's uh, parlance. So the other thing is that just because something is technically possible doesn't mean that we're absolutely going to do it. So technical, technical feasibility, is, technological feasibility is not enough. I would love to go over and back between Boston and Concord, but it no longer exists, even though the technology is there to do that. 
Um, so now, um, looking at some uh, actual real unknown unknowns, this is what Rumsfeld was talking about. Things that we don't know that we don't even know. How would we know them? Because, you know, I don't know what I don't know. Um, one a good example, going back quite a bit in history, is when, in around the 1600s, when they discovered optical lenses. Somebody could have sat around and they had a version of this uh, back then. They might have said, well, you know, now people who have got short sight, I'm very short-sighted myself, I, all those people now are going to come back into the workforce. We're going to have a real problem with unemployment, and that could have been the policy discussion. Who would have known at that point that actual discovery of optical lenses has pretty much led to all of science since, because there was no microscope, there was no telescope. Without two of those things, effectively, we would not have anything like we know as science today. So that discovery of the glasses led to all science. That's an unknown unknown. Who would have guessed where we were today coming out of it. Does artificial intelligence or machine learning have that capability? Very difficult for us to say because it's an unknown unknown. Those who are making those predictions are just guessing. But I will say that there are tiny little examples of it. One I really like is a group at Stanford did a piece of research on diabetic retinopathy, which is for diabetic people. And traditionally, you had to go to an ophthalmologist and they would have take an image of the eye and they would then have a look at it under a microscope, I guess, and be able to tell whether this person, their disease was getting worse and eventually would lead them to blindness. And so the guys at Stanford and a couple of them at Google as well, they got together, they took these images, they trained them up, and now the machine learning was better than humans, the best Stanford ophthalmologists at predicting whether this was going to get bad or worse, or, you know, get, get, stay the same or get worse. So not that interesting so far. The really interesting part is that the computer scientists came back in one of the meetings and they said, you know, and also our statistical reliability and identification of the gender of the patient has also increased. And the ophthalmologist said, sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. Actually, the machine learning algorithm had been able to identify from the image whether it was a male or a female. We did not know whether that was possible. No human being had ever uh, been able to look at the image and tell the sex of the patient. Um, the response from the ophthalmologist was, uh, we also have a way of doing that. We look at the patient. So it's not a particularly useful thing. It hasn't in any way brought it forward, but it's an unknown and known in terms of coming into the, the research. And maybe there's a whole bunch of stuff out there. Maybe there's lots of unpicked apples on the tree. Um, so one thing that I think everybody likes to talk about is how is this going to impact labor? And so um, Rumsfeld was asked a very different, definitive question about is there weapons of mass uh, dis uh, uh, destruction? And he gave this convoluted, obtuse answer. Um, I'm going to use that same uh, framework to try and answer is there a threat is there a, substantial, is there a threat that a substantial part of the workforce is becoming the economic equivalent of horses because of artificial intelligence? Are we all, is everybody going to lose their job and is the labour apocalypse coming? Well, um, I think that's particularly prevalent in Ireland. We've always uh, be every country is, but I think particularly in Ireland this kind of stuff really resonates. Um, there, I should say that the economic lens is not the only one we should be using to look at this. Voltaire said, work saves a man from three great evils, boredom, vice, and need. And so really the economic side of it is barely touching the need part. Um, let's say it's maybe only partially covering it. So I think when it comes to universal basic income and lots of other discussions that I'm not going to be able to cover today, I think the boredom and vice parts are very important parts of the equation, but I'm not going to talk about them just now. So. What it is is that um, I, I'm going to talk to you about is that we do know from history about previous automation technologies and that machine learning uh, is a type of automation technology. And we've modeled these, and Dan and plenty of other people who work in the economics field will understand there's a, there's a long litany of research that goes back into studying automation. But um, when we come along today, lots of people are talking about us, and, and there's lots of pushback. Every time a new automation technology comes along from the Luddites since, everybody thinks, wow, you know, we really need to worry about this one. And then, you know, there's a lot of talk, well, would this time be different? And so you get different people on different sides of the, the aisle talking about, uh, you know, Usually it comes to the point of view that I'm a techno-optimist. And to be honest, I'm going to find reasons to explain to everybody here why it is that my point of view is right. And then you've got the techno-pessimists, and they've got very valid reasons as to why they think the future, which none of us know, is going to be right. And really, this is a false dichotomy, is that it's really not about these two camps. What we do know, and there is some knowns, is what I'm going to talk about. So how will an economist, act, you know, this is the economics of AI. What will a serious economist do to try to model some of these things? And the devil is in the detail, because loads of people 
like saying, you know, 40% of all jobs are going to be gone. Um, I don't know where they got, well, I do know where they got those figures from, uh, but I don't pay any heed to them. The, this little model I'm going to show you, obviously, if it is, you know, written down economics model, would be horrific to look at. Nobody wants to talk about it. But at three or four steps, we can actually show you where we're looking for the, uh, the impact of uh, AI and the economy. So the first one is what we call the displacement effect. And this is the easiest one for us to understand. But the key point here is that uh, automation, artificial intelligence, does not replace jobs. It replaces tasks. Um, and nearly everybody in the economy has lots of different tasks that they do in their job. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're a lawyer, you do an awful lot more than reviewing the documents. <laughs> There's a hell of a lot more to it being, to being a lawyer. And depends on where you are in your career, you might do more or less of it. And so everybody is, uh, nearly everybody is the same. I picked out quite a simple lab, uh, job. So somebody, it's not easy to do, of course, but uh, somebody who works in the Amazon fulfill, Fulfillment Center, they used to have to do two tasks. They'd have to go retrieve the, uh, go to where in the big warehouse the item that they're getting for Jonathan is. They'd have to retrieve it, and then they'd have to physically go in and pick it. And now what Amazon have done is they've automated one of those tasks, uh, using plenty of machine learning, and that is the retrieval. So the little robot here on the bottom, uh, if you can uh, see it there. That goes off into a uh, the little orange one. Um, they, Kiva Robots, they were originally called. It was a company just outside Boston that Amazon bought. And they'll go out into a three-story warehouse the size of a football field. And they'll... Um, American football field, not a real football field like Crow Park, so um, <clears throat> half the size. So they'll, uh, they'll go out and they'll retrieve the... A quarter pallet that contains the item Jonathan wants. And all the human does is stand in that little bay. He's not actually allowed outside into the rest of the warehouse. The warehouse shuts down if he starts moving around. It has sensors for humans, uh, against humans. Um, and he stands in that one place, and then he picks and he puts into the box. Okay, so machine learning has halved the labor here for simplistic uh, terms. Uh, because it's taken away one of the tasks. On aggregate, we'd expect that you need half as much labor. So that's the displacement effect. We all know that, and we can all really understand it. What's really difficult to start to understand is some of the other um, effects that start to happen. Um, so let's say now Amazon, as an entity, you'll have to you know, go through this with me, but Amazon costs decline because they now, let's say the cost of those robots is free. Over time, it probably gets to almost free for Amazon, whereas previously they had to pay somebody $15 an hour. So now Amazon costs uh, decline. Amazon are in a competitive market with Walmart or whatever. This productivity increases. What they do is pass on the lower cost to Jonathan and everybody else. So with this additional income, I now have more money in my pocket, me being the universal <coughs> person out there in the economy. I'll go out and buy something else. And say I spend my money on haircuts. I used to only get a cut once a month. I'm getting a cut every fortnight. That actually increases demand for labor somewhere else in the economy. Now, if you're able to model the exact impact of the substitution effect over uh, to this uh, increase in, in barbers, well then I'm pretty sure you'll win lots of economic prizes. We don't know how to do this. It's far too complex in the economy. But we know in total this kind of stuff uh, definitely happens. But that's not the only thing. There's actually an interesting effect that happens with automation um, that also boosts labor that maybe might not be intuitive at the start. Lots of the economy is already automated. Okay, so this is a Google data center. These are the, the mechanism they use to cool the servers that power our Google searches. And this was already automated. It just wasn't done very well. So when machine learning came along, the very smart people at Google trained their algorithms to improve the efficiency of this system. And they had remarkable uh, improvements. Something that, you know, they used to eke out 0.1 or 0.2% year-on-year improvements. This came along and brought a 40% improvement in efficiency because they use machine learning. So when machine learning was applied to that Google problem, no human being lost their jobs. However, let's follow my model. This reduces Google's costs. It drops the cost to all its customers. Google doesn't really, it works a bit funny like that. But let's assume Google drops the cost, or at least Amazon in the equivalent would drop its cost to everybody. And now we all go out and buy more, uh, get more haircuts. That happened 
uh, and the replacement effect, but with no substitution effect, okay? So that's the second thing we might want to think about. Again, if you can model that, uh, there's probably a Nobel Prize in it for you. Um, okay, so the third one then I want to talk about is the creation of new tasks that are complementary to the technology. So every new technology that comes along, what you'll see is that these self-driving... Uh, that's, uh, uh, an MIT professor back there who runs the uh, Toyota Self-Driving Car Institute, and um, he now he left MIT and actually took a bunch of his researchers with them. They they got replaced at MIT, but they all have new jobs now working for Toyota doing self-driving cars. They're new jobs that didn't exist. Okay, so all these different factors that interplay are very complex, impossible to model in advance. This, in terms of like have the absolute numbers. But this is a much more solid framework for thinking about some of these problems um, than maybe lots of the headline factors that like 40% of people are going to lose their jobs. They simply are, I would say, um, a bad way of looking at it. Uh, this would be a, a, a lot better. And, and so as the technology develops, these are the kind of things that we're going to be looking at. So do we know um, how all these things are going to balance out? No. We don't. Um, uh, the, uh, so what I will talk about... One thing that we do know that's happened to previous technologies, again, think about the total economy. <clears throat> it's not the only driver of this, but it's, it's a reasonable one, is that as you put more machinery into the economy, uh, more technology, more robots, let's call them, then more of the share of the spoils of the economy are going to the people who paid for those robots, the capital, and less is going to the workers, the labor. And so that is one thing. <clears throat> uh, we don't really know the ins and, out of it, uh, ins and outs of it completely, but certainly over the last several decades, the share that's going to labor is getting lower and lower and lower. Uh, and uh, one concern I would have about uh, automation driven by machine learning is that's likely to continue. So if you think about that guy working in the Amazon center, less money is going to the employee and more is going to um, Jeff Bezos because he owns the robot, if, you, if that makes sense. Um, the other big thing I would actually be, be worried about is, uh, again, it, from the outside, it's maybe not so obvious, but what we call so-so technologies. So when you, it turns out, actually, when we model all of this stuff, when you, t when you look at the really big technologies that have come out, so something like the internal combustion engine or the uh, personal computer, the smartphone, the internet, those really big things, what we call general purpose technologies, some people are most afraid of those. Actually, when we model them all, they're the ones that tend to have positive, when you add up all those different effects, they have positive impact on total labor. So they're not the ones we wor should worry about. The ones we should worry about are what we call so-so technology. So an example of this is, <clears throat> you know when you ring the reception of a lot of small and medium-sized companies, um, they no longer put you straight on to the receptionist. They say, you know, it's an automated machine saying press one, two, three, or four, or whatever. Okay, <clears throat> that clearly had some substitution effects. In other words, some people lost their jobs in the total economy because of that. But it was not a big enough technology that you had all the other things. We had no new people working on this technology. You developed it, and then, you know, we don't have the equivalence of the self-driving car engineers and all the other stuff that goes with it. It wasn't big enough to feed through into the general economy, so no people went getting their hair cut <clears throat> because of the extra savings they have. So these so-so technologies, they're what I kind of would worry about a bit more in terms of the total economy. I don't think machine learning is one of them. Inevitably, though, there's going to be winners and losers. So even Isaac Newton used to talk about this. We enjoy today higher standards of living because we are standing on the broken backs of those who paved the way for technological progress but did not live long enough to benefit from it. Um, the interesting thing that's probably different, the only thing that's different today from Isaac Newton is that a lot of the people whose backs are broken, to use his analogy, will still be around and will live long enough because the technology has happened so quick and we're all living a bit longer. So the adjustment costs for an economy, uh, in, when you add all those things up, you know, somebody who only cares about the total economy could be happy enough because machine learning is going to come on, it's going to improve productivity. In the long term, that actually makes us all wealthier. But if you're that individual person who's just lost their job, it doesn't feel very good. And that is something that we really should be worried about. We have plenty of research to suggest that these are real problems. I don't need... <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, there are lots of examples from Limerick when Dell pulled out or Fruit of the Loom in Donegal or, you know, there's so many of these examples that we're used to that are embedded into, you know, the Irish psyche. But... 
um, you know, it usually takes economists about 10 years after everybody else knows something so they can model it. So this is an example of a couple of my colleagues, or Darren, a colleague of my MIT, in the research they did, hey presto, showed that when they introduced lots of robots, basically to a city like Detroit, where they used to make cars, um, that was bad for labor. So that's the big insight there. So if your job is taken by a robot and everybody in your town does that same job, it's going to be bad for house prices in that city. We've managed to prove it. That's the big insight. Okay, no, everybody knew this already, and so that's what we're really what we're what we're working at. Since World War II, you know, there's lots of these technologies that came along before World War II. Uh, but for the Western world, Ireland, about 20 years later, we put in lots of these safety nets. So uh, the old age pension came along, uh, early 1900s. Then unemployment insurance. Then we do retraining programs. You know, we put these safety nets in place. <clears throat> because successive governments and us as the people recognize that these are negative and they're unfair that somebody has, you know, that there's a loser out there, let's call them, in, in the economic sense. But <clears throat> really, the problem is not that there was not enough effort or care, in my opinion, or consideration for the people. The problem is it's just really not worked very well. Um, and so if there was another Dell moment to happen, you know, when Dell pulled out of Limerick, <clears throat> if Intel were to pull out of uh, leak slip, something like that, uh, if, if, certainly if it had happened during the, the crisis, it's not that we wouldn't be willing as a nation to support those people, it's just that we don't really have the tools to do very much for them. And why is that? Actually, uh, it's something called, uh, it's been, <laughs> an economist talked about this, about I think it was 1950s, this, uh, the human being putty and clay, it's the putty and clay problem. When you're young and you're at school, your mind is like putty. You're open to all these different opportunities. You might work here, you might work there. You haven't locked down on your skill set and your jobs, so you're like putty. By the time you're 40, let's call it, you're now like solid clay. You don't want to change. You, you, you want to keep doing what it is that you, you keep doing. And so this is, a, a, once again, we all pretty much know this. You can't teach an old drug new tricks or so, but now we have an economics term for it. So um, the problem is that even if something like uh, this new automation technology comes along, truck drivers cannot easily become orthopedic surgeons or radiologists because the, the, you know, the market needs more of orthopedic surgeons and we now have all this excess labor in in the truck drivers. That's a really big problem. And again, this is something that's known. We know about the problem, but it's unknown in terms of how we solve it. Um, and I don't think it's a bad actor problem. Uh, certainly, I mean, even in America, they, they care about now trying to look after these people. Um, so, I mean, if the Americans are onto it. Um, and yeah, the one good thing I would say about Ireland, though, is that if you look at the, the US, for example, you know, for decades from after post-World War II all the way up to the 70s, late 70s, US productivity went up. In other words, things were getting better. We're all becoming more productive. And thankfully, wages stayed in line with that, which is great. That's what you want, because it's the workers who bring about the productivity when they work with technology. But since then, those two things have diverged, and productivity continues to grow to go uh, to go up. Uh, the returns go to capital, and the returns are not going to the average worker. That's a major problem in an economy like the U.S., which is not very focused on redistribution. Ireland is highly focused on redistribution. Um, relatively, everything's relative, of course, but uh, relatively high. Uh, transfers from people who are doing uh, better to people who aren't doing so well. In fact, we're one of the most redistributive economies in the world. So I think that the same automation type effects are going to come into America and they're going to come into Ireland with AI. But I think Ireland, because of our social contract, because of the, the way we all get on with each other, we don't want to see our neighbour uh, particularly lose out. We do, everybody knows somebody from Limerick or from Donegal whose jobs get affected. So we're all in this together. That solidarity is very important. That stops these kinds of things happening at the net effect. It's, it's almost impossible to start to, to really affect it before tax. But after tax, we're, we're, we should keep going with this, with, with what we're doing in Ireland. Um, because if you are in an economy which you don't have it, such as America, it's a lot bigger problem. Um, so I'll talk maybe about one more quick thing, which is when it comes to artificial intelligence, it's not just about the technology. Really, a lot of the development uh, that's happened in the recent past, it sits 
pretty much in a very small number of companies and a very small uh, amount of researchers' heads. But we're getting this out very fast. And the companies that are first to adopt it, that really makes a big difference. Um, so to give you an example, going back to previous technologies, when electricity came out first, um, uh, you know the United States story better, um, the people, let's say, I mean, this is a simplified story, of course it didn't happen, but the the guy who was going around selling electricity, he would go to a factory owner and he says, hey, you know, do you want electricity? You're doing it by a steam engine today. Mm -hmm. Now, we would think that's pretty much an easy decision to make for the factory owner. And for about 30 years, the factory owner says, no, you're good. We don't need electricity. We're fine without it. So it's bonkers to us today. Why would you not use electricity? Well, the interesting thing is you have to understand that um, uh, the factory was already in place. The factory owner has already built it. And then maybe they've paid and depreciated the entire building and all the machinery. So like, I have this one for free. Why am I going to pay you a million dollars for these new motors and getting connected to electricity? Um, the next thing that happened, and it's interesting with the electricity one, is Previously, and you can kind of see it here with these, see these belts that are going on the uh, on the chain or going on the wheels. Um, we had one big steam-powered engine in the middle of the factory, and then we had lots of these belts feeding these machines that come out of this one big engine. And so factories were laid out according to this, and all the science in terms of operational effectiveness it wasn't called that then was was how do you get the belts to be more efficient, etc. And that's how factories were laid out. And it took a full generation of managers and probably owners to figure out, with electricity, um, the, the original motors they were selling were just one big motor to replace the middle steam-powered engine. And then they figured out, actually, we can have lots of little motors all around the factory. And we can lay the factory out completely differently. And it was with that insight from a managerial point of view, coupled with the technological advancement, that enables us to, uh, to change how factories were laid out. And we had a dramatic increase in productivity. Uh, Henry Ford figured this out famously uh, with, with many of his factories. So it can often take a long time for new technology to diffuse into the economy, even though sitting around here today, we think, well, why won't every factory manager just take it over? Um, so, uh, yeah, so why, why that really matters is that these interdependencies matter a lot. When Netflix wants to use machine learning to improve its recommendation engine, it doesn't have to call anybody else. It just builds it into how it does its software. When Google wants to introduce a self-driving car, there is a lot of interdependencies. It doesn't just have to create the car. It also has to figure out about insurance. It also has to figure out about other road users, vehicle manufacturers, and a whole pile of other things. So when we think about AI and how it, it deploys into different use cases and different industries, these interdependencies make a big difference. Um, and the final one I'd maybe talk about then is that like another thing holding it back or accelerating is the tolerance for error. Because when machine learning something it algorithm knows something, it has a statistical insight into whether it's likely to happen or not. It's different than how a human knows it. So um, when I'm using Gmail, uh, has anybody had this experience? You're typing along and it's trying to predict the rest of the sentence for you. Well, so what if it gets it wrong? No big deal. Okay. It'll keep iterating and it'll be allowed the chance to keep iterating and get better and better. And, you know, I find it brilliant now. The same company uh, it brings out a self-driving car. It doesn't have this, the human beings don't have the same tolerance for error with car driving as we do for email text prediction. Okay, so when Google the self-driving car crashes, it has to take it off the road. So if you can't go out there and experiment a lot and try and iterate an awful lot, and the tolerance for error is very high, it will slow down the introduction of the of the technology. And let's see. I think. Yeah, let's finish on that one. Yeah. Okay.